morning, everyone. Hey, would you guys stand with me as uh, we get ready to worship Jesus? How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? Good. Hey, my name's Tally, if you don't know, um, and I just want to let you know I'm so excited to sing this morning with you. Um, and I want to just encourage you and let you know that this platform I'm on, there's nothing significant about it. I am in no way above you, maybe physically right now because I'm a little bit taller, uh, but this is not like a show. This is not like um, me performing or anything. This is me just encouraging you to worship Jesus because I know how life can be sometimes. Uh, life can be a little difficult and it will affect our praise. So this morning, I wanna encourage you and I wanna lead by example that Jesus is worthy of praise. He's worthy of all of the honor. He's worthy of all the glory. And I also wanna encourage you that it is worth it this morning to shake off any bit of exhaustion or stress or maybe sleepiness. You got boogers in your eyes or anything like that. He's worthy of our praise, amen? Let's pray real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that, Lord, this worship time would be set apart. It would be different than even yesterday and last week. Lord, we pray that right now we would um, just have a heart to worship you that our minds would be set on you, the name above every other name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. At your name, the mountain shake.
love this verse. It says in Philippians 2, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, giving him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth. Someone say, on earth. And under earth too, I love that. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God our Father. He's the name above every other name. And that's why we sing to him this morning. So that's why it's worth showing up to a building, you know, when all of culture says it's weird to do this anymore, we know we can come back to his word and see that God has given him the name above every other name. So it makes us show up on Sunday mornings and sing. And it makes us do something a little bit different than what our culture does. I just want to encourage you that, you know, whatever you think about this moment right now or whatever your maybe you have preconceived ideas of what church is, I want to encourage you and let you know that the Holy Spirit is in this place this morning because you and I are here and we're singing to his name and it is his joy to be with us this morning. Amen. Let's keep singing. Your name.
Would you tell him that you love Jesus? Just say, I love you. And we need your help too. Our nation and our world need your help, Lord. Our families need you. Our neighborhoods need you. <clears throat> Only you can do it, Lord. There's no one else. There's no better idea. There's no greater strategy than just you. some praise in this place. Hey, before we go, I, or before we, you know, transition, say what's up to people, I just want to remind you that you are so loved by God and there's nothing you've ever done and there's nothing you could ever do to undo his love for you. And so I want to let you know too that if you're in pain this morning, if you're in, if you're in a season of just confusion, I want to encourage you just to seek the Lord because he's not pulling away from you. He's pursuing you this morning. And he is loving you. And here's the greatest thing. His love casts out all fears. All fear. It casts every bit of fear out. And, and it's so simple. You can just say this even tomorrow morning on your way to work. Father, show me your love today. Amen? Amen. All right. Find one person you don't know and say, what's up? Morning, live stream. We love you guys. We're glad that you're joining us. We're so happy to have you with us. We pray that even as we were worshiping, that you were just encouraged and you sense the presence of God in your houses with your kids. Maybe you're watching this back. The Lord's so good and He wants to speak to you and encourage you. We love you and we're glad that you're part of our church family. So, welcome this morning to being with us online. We love you guys. They love to hang out here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Hallelujah. We love our first service people. They love each other a lot. We're glad that you're here this morning. Would you guys find your seats? Um, my name is Becca Smith, and I am our discipleship pastor. I run a school of ministry. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Richard Sherman. I'm a resident sound person here at the church, and also I play bass sometimes. And he does all kinds of things for us. Um, this morning, um, before we start, we want to take a minute and just pray for our president and for our country as we're getting ready to celebrate President's Day tomorrow. So would you join us as we pray? Richie's going to pray. God, we lift up our nation and our president to you. To say right now that this country is going through a turbulent time would be an understatement. And I just pray that, and we all pray, that you give our president wisdom to go through these times and with the best wisdom and anything that you can give him, God, to make the right decisions for our country and for any kind of um, consequences of our actions around the uh, world as well. Um, and I just pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 
Amen. Well, we want to welcome you this morning to Escondido Christian Church. If this is your first time, um, we're glad that you're here with us. There's a high card right in front of you. If you want to grab it, you can fill that out, and then you can meet me out here in the lobby, and I would love to give you a gift for that card. Um, we have a special little thing in there for you, and so we would love to be able to bless you, but we really, more than anything, are just so glad that you're here with us this morning. Also, uh, next Sunday on February 27th is Kids Team Appreciation Sunday. We are inviting you guys to show your love to them by going over to the uh, children's ministry area and writing a personalized card for anyone that could be there to just show your love and appreciation for them. As a new parent, um, I can say that the benefits of them are amazing and they just love every kid that comes in and it's truly an amazing thing. So this is the last weekend to do that. Um, so stop by the kids counter and write your note and also next Sunday, um, if you feel led to do so, have your kid or yourself go over and send something and give something more personalized. Absolutely. I can't wait to celebrate them. I got a bunch of kids over there, so we're excited. Um, I want to take a minute and just invite you, let you know that on April 8th and 9th, we are going to be hosting a prophetic weekend. Again, how many of you joined us last year for a prophetic weekend? Awesome. Um, I don't know if you've been here, or if you've been around, you might have heard someone say, the Lord said this to me, or I, I feel like God's telling me this. And we want to partner with you and teach you how to be equipped in this, to be able to recognize that God's speaking to you, and then activate that in you, where um, we'll give you even special time to come together and give you a partner and just begin to press into that a little bit more. And then more than anything, we want to encounter God during this time. So um, we have an incredible weekend planned. God's speaking. God's speaking to you. As his sheep, you know his voice. That's what he yeah. says. And so we want to teach you how, how he's talking to you, and then what do you do with what he's saying. So would you consider joining us? You can sign up on the app. It's called Prophetic Weekend. It's April 8th and 9th. It's $50. Um, you can pay online as you register. But we want to invite you just to come and be a part of what God's doing on the earth as he brings his kingdom. The Holy Spirit's stirring up gifts. And it's so much fun to partner with him as he speaks. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you're serving here this week. All the ushers in the back. All these other people. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, if you want to be a part of uh, any team here, we're looking for more volunteers, um, especially in the production live stream and kids teams. Um, and again, as someone who is a part of the production team, I've been serving for, I think, six years now. And the amount of um, joy that I get from serving here, the friends that I've made, the opportunities I've been given, all that stuff, like, I don't typically get the opportunity to work on a soundboard, and that's pretty fun, and that's just a really neat opportunity um, that I've got to have. And so if you want to be a part of any of those teams, if you feel called to do something and do a little more, um, then you can go into the app and look at the uh, next steps um, part of it, and uh, you can tap on join team. And then I think uh, we have a little simple form to fill out that, uh, so that we can just get a good idea of where like the right fit would be. Yeah. So yeah, I would highly encourage anyone who feels led to serve, to serve. Absolutely, it's a fun way to be part of a community too. Absolutely. So. All right, we're gonna move into our time of giving. So ushers, if you would come forward, there's three ways that you can give. You can give um, with cash or check in an envelope right in front of you. You can give on our app digitally or you can drop it off on the way out, but we, we um, love to be generous here. We partner with God with our money, right? Because everything that we have comes from him. So we're going we're gonna to pray, all right? Lord, we thank you so much um, for every household represented, every family. Lord, I thank you for a spirit of generosity that really is in our people, God. They are so willing to give when there's a need or just to partner with what you're doing. And I pray that you would continue just to stir that up, that we would be yes. cheerful givers because you love that. God, that we would be outrageously <laughs> generous in yeah. ways as you lead us, that we would walk in obedience to that, and that you would continue just to multiply um, our, our ability to give. And Lord, I just thank you for what you're going to do this morning. Would you open up our hearts to hear your word? And Lord, would you bless us as we come together in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, everyone. Well, it's my honor to introduce everyone's favorite number-crunching bird lady, Rochelle Tullius.
Thank you. Number crunching and bird lady all together in one phrase. For those of you who weren't with us last week, number crunching, I'm the accountant here at ECC. Um, but bird lady, I have an odd and weird and over-the-top obsession with birds. Thus, my arm is exposed today and you can see my tattoos. I realized I was a bird lady when I realized I have more than like nine birds tattooed on me. <laughs> so that's where I was like, maybe we have a problem. <laughs> Um, well, good morning. How is everybody? Yeah? Can I get a good? Give me a good, good. You're going to have to warm up those vocal cords because, my friends, today is going to be a ride. We are in week two of a three-part series, and that is Restoring Financial Hope. And so last week, just to kind of go over this real quick, um, last week, we went over a couple of main points, and I, if you guys haven't listened to the message, I do encourage you to go back and listen to the message. It's a foundational understanding that's really going to help us springboard into today, and also, especially into week three. But the points from last week, just to make sure we have our foundation here. God created the garden, Garden of Eden, to sustain man's life, filled it, the land with riches. So he put into the, into the Garden of Eden everything man would need to be able to sustain a good life. He designed a place, which is the garden, where he could dwell and walk with man. Man fell into temptation and became aware of good and evil. Man and woman were then banished from the garden to cultivate and work the ground for survival. Last week, we went into the kind of the history and the fundamentals of how ancient civilizations really began to cultivate and work the ground to be able to produce finances that sustained their life and also gave a quality of life. But in that lesson last week, we went over that God, knowing that man was separated from him, desired to have man again close to him. So he sent Jesus as the ultimate redemption plan to restore the original intent of the garden, the intimate relationship with the Father. Remember the Father walked through the garden. There was relationship. The God, God was with man, but not just like in a physical way, but he was with him emotionally, intimately. See, he made it better, though. When Jesus came, he broke the curse. He fulfilled the law. He became the, the solution that restored man to the Father. But he did it better because he put that garden intention, the relationship, and he put the kingdom with all resources accessible in us. Now I know what you're thinking. Wow, it's in me. So here's how we're going to springboard into today because today is a fun day. Say fun day. I'm going to love every minute of this. Say it again for the people in back. I'm going to love every minute of this. Of course, before I get started, I want to do something. I have this heaviness on my heart. I'm going to address the heaviness. Because every time I get a little bit of heaviness on my heart, I realize that there's something that we need to take care of before we can dive deep into God's word. Money, the topic of money, the topic of finances, especially in the church, is an area that there can be a lot of damage. There can have been a lot of poor teaching. There can have been a lot of aggressive um, pushing upon. There could have been, there's prosperity gospel. There's all these different things that have affected the way that we view church, money, ministry, God's word. When I bring up the topic of money, I recognize that I'm in front of a whole diverse group of people who all have a different relationship with money. And I'm going to be talking about that relationship with money today. But if you would accept, would you please forgive us, the church, for any of the areas that you have had those negative, those bad experiences? The Lord wants to be anew to you. The Lord has something for this next season for you. And within that next season, he meant it when he said he redeemed that whole ugly curse. He meant it when he said, I have something better for you. I have something great for you. So as we go into this message today, if you would have an open heart, that the Lord is not going after the boom, 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 this is what we're going to cover today. He's going after something tender. And that's really dealing with that intimate relationship that we have with him. So can we say, I want that intimate relationship, and I'm totally open. And when I'm not open, my neighbor will nudge me. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's say, so here we are. So now we know that the kingdom lives within us. 
Hooray, the kingdom, kingdom is inside of us. That means that we have access to all of the kingdom resources. So therefore, let me just paint this fun picture for you. Therefore, we are man living on earth as human beings. We have sin nature with us and we have God nature. But also, when you accept the Lord and he dwells within you, that means you have dual citizenship because you also reside where? You are hanging out with the Lord. You have dual citizenship, which means you have the dual opportunity to live on earth but have access to the kingdom. So with that, does okay, congratulations, guys. We accepted the Lord, and all of a sudden our eyes are open, and everywhere we look, there's resources everywhere we go. Man, I accepted the Lord, and I went home, and my bank account was like, you know, $4 million. I don't know where it came from. Hallelujah. That ain't how it goes. <laughs> well, I mean, if that has, I mean, if that's how it goes, I would love to be that example. Um, but here's the thing: like, you know, you don't just wake up one day and be like, "Lord, I love you. Congratulations, we're in a relationship. Now I get everything my heart desires." God's like, "Yeah, let's see how that works out for you, my friend." See, the thing is, is that I love what Dame's, Dave Ramsey says. This is one of my favorite, favoriteest quotes: "Money makes you more of what you already are." So if you just get a bunch of money, I'm going to look at lottery winners. Now, and I'm not talking about, like, you know, a couple hundred thousand. You know, that's, that's a good amount of money. I'm talking about, like, the mega millions. Everybody in here plays the lottery when they're just like, I just, I can see myself. I can see myself winning. And you're driving and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to buy homes for my neighbors. And I'm going to give money to the church. And I'm going to start a whole nonprofit organization. And you're telling yourself how generous and amazing you're going to be. And more money is the way to make it happen, right? And everyone's like, amen. Um, but the thing is, is that more lottery winners, when they receive, I mean, this is hilarious, but really sad at the same time, 80% of large jackpot winners lose all of their money and more after about seven years. 80%. Which means that all more money did was amplify and enable their issues. So when we come to the Lord and we say, well, I, I just, I want, I need more, God. I need more. I need, I need access to these kingdom resources. He goes, is more really going to help you or is more going to disable you? So he's, he brings up the topic of stewardship. Oh, here comes the church topic of stewardship. Stewardship. What is stewardship? Stewardship is management of the resources and the things that he has given you. But not just management, wisdom and management of the things that he has given you. Stewardship. It's not just instruction, though. It was actually our purpose. Genesis 2.15. The Lord placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Man was placed in the resources and given the purpose of being the person who walks around and tends to it and keeps the garden. He had a purpose there in the garden. You see, stewardship means that we demonstrate discipline by wisely caring for the resources God has entrusted us with. Resources in this conversation today is money. I'm not talking about all the other resources that we could possibly put here. I am specifically speaking about financial resources. But the greatest part about God is that God, from the very beginning, has given us freedom. He has given us the freedom of choice. He has given us the freedom of, of how, we, how we act. He's given us, and well, what happened with that freedom in the garden? Well, man and woman took part in sin, and next thing you know, we are kicked out of the garden. But with the ability of having freedom, we also have the ability to respond. So we have response... And we have ability. That sounds like responsibility, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> responsibility. But we don't like to talk about responsibility. So I'm going to talk about response and ability. Does that make it better? All right. <laughs> you see, the thing about response and ability is that to do something, you have to have motivation to do it. You have to have discipline. Discipline takes motivation. Oh, here we're talking about discipline now in church. All the words we love. Let me talk about discipline for a moment. Discipline 
being disciplined as a person means that we can, um, we, we, oh, here we go. Being disciplined can mean that you are disciplining yourself to do stuff. I am going to go to the gym. I am going to go and get coffee. I am going to get to work on time. I'm disciplined. I'm being disciplined to go and do something. Now, self-discipline is being deeply committed to a focus on what you really want versus what you want right now. Why is this such an important distinction between the two of these? Because ultimately, we have freedom and response, but we need to have discipline that is fueled by motivation. To do that, we have to go into priorities. Oh, so many big words today. Priorities, well, what are priorities? Everybody think to yourself and go ahead and start speaking them out loud. What are our top priorities in life? What do you think the first one is? Family, spouses, who comes first in everything? God, what else? Is there anything else in that priority list? Children, oh, they got a, they're in there somewhere. <laughs> Our homes, vehicles. So there's all these, there are all these priorities that we have. Now, let's all think to ourselves real quick. There's a list of priorities that we make. And we go, okay. And then in, in really churchy terms, we go, all right. Father first, spouses, family, home, and jobs. That's, that tends to be kind of how we hear stewardship. Stewardship of those items. And then what happens is that we then, we look at our natural life and we compare it to the priorities. I'm going to use Scott and myself as an example. Scott is my husband. You know, we went through this list of priorities and it's like, God first, you know, then we've got our each other and then we went right down to, you know, kids and I was like, well, good. Well, what does good mean? Well, we, we want to be present with our kids. We want to have conversations with our kids. And we listed all these incredible self-help book descriptions of what the perfect parent looks like. And the great part was is that we realized that we do none of that. And if anybody asks me what I have a microphone on in the hand is, oh, yes, that is the exact, I mean, mm, in the mind, that is what priorities look like. When in actuality, Scott and I come home from work, we kind of walk around and kick our shoes off. We hurry to get a show on the TV for the kids and allow them to play their video games. And then we find a spot that's quiet. We put our feet up and we plop on the phone and we check out. That's reality. <laughs> And we were like, oh, that's probably not parenting 101. But like, what was it? But my, in my heart, my priorities were this. But in actuality, the, the actual things that happened were this. Oh, there's a big contrast between priorities and what actually happens. You see, priorities are where you spend your time. And so when you think you have this mental list of priorities that, in, and you kind of like fool yourself a little bit, like, oh, I'm totally all about these priorities. And then you have somebody like a spouse be like, that's not your priority. <laughs> yeah, that's not your priority. And you really start to take a look at what your priorities are. You realize it's your priorities that motivate your discipline. So the question is, where does God fall into your list of priorities? I hope that the answer would be, that right there at the top. But as we go into this lesson, I would just ask that you would maybe take a look because the challenge I have for you today is not a challenge to browbeat. This is not a challenge to school you and to make you feel bad about stuff. It's really truly a moment where the Lord's opening an opportunity for us to be able to look at where in our priority list do things actually fall and do our actions back that up. You see, your priorities are where you spend your focus, your time, and this is where you spend your financial resources. Our, our, our topic of restoring financial hope, it starts with the recognition that the Father wants intimacy with us. That resources come from Him. We went over that in the garden. That God created riches. God called them good. God created everything we need to sustain our life. And he just wants that relationship with us. But now, we're like, God, that's amazing in Bible terms. But now, here's this crazy reality. We live on earth. 
and I live a priority-based life with practical bills, with practical finances, and I've got all these practical things, but then I'm also in heaven here with my, my heavenly resources. So how in the world do I manage the two of these things? How do I manage practical living with heavenly resources? Because I prayed and it didn't show up. Okay, I tried the tithe thing out, and I just, I just, I don't know, I don't quite have buy-in quite yet. You see, it all starts with the heart. All of this starts with the heart. The heart can feel a lot of things. The heart can feel hurt. The, the heart can feel happy. The heart can feel like it's had tough times. The heart can, the heart is really what pushes the motivation. To have financial hope, we have to go to the root, the, the, the real root behind the finance part. So to get there, I get to walk through the topic of the tithe. Everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> Half the room is so excited that I just said the word tithe. Half the room would stand up and be like, this is a discipline I learned. And then there's others that are like, this is a discipline I've heard. And then there's others that are like, this is a discipline I not quite believe. And then there's people who are just like, why is she talking about that word again? For those of you who don't know what the tithe is, the tithe means a tenth. And it means a tenth of the first fruits. The most used scripture to describe the tithe is Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes a tenth of your first fruits. Your first fruits mean your increase. Increase means resources. Resources mean finance. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, the church that you call home, your city church, the church that you are a part of, that there may be food in my house, my capitalized God's house. And try me in this now, the one time that God says, test me in this, my friends, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. Now, how many of you guys have done that and have been like, I really don't think I see the not enough room to receive it part. So then there's a battle between whether or not the tithe was something that was part of the old, the old law. Jesus came back and he fulfilled the law. So there's a, there's a whole line of thinking that the tithe is something that's Old Testament versus New Testament. In layman's terms, it's the Old Covenant, the law, the covenant, versus Jesus coming to fulfill the law and creates a new covenant where we are accepted in, give it up for the Gentiles, ooh, ooh, that's us, and that we get to take part in the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that everything that you see, God's word doesn't just fall flat. It keeps going. So if we got blessings back with Abraham and he gets as, as many descendants of a star, guess what, guys? You guys are a star. And every promise, especially the Deuteronomy 28 promise, that's yours. But here we go. So now we've got Old Testament versus New Testament. One of my favorite references that Jesus makes in his teachings. Now, mind you, Jesus does a lot of teachings about money, but he does it from an increase parable way. He does it with um, the talking a lot about, um, for instance, um, generosity, cheerful giver. You guys, we're not quite yet to cheerful giver. Come back for week three and we'll talk about cheerful giver. But right now, a cheerful giver needs a thankful heart, and that's what we're going after today. In Matthew 22, 15 through 20, I'm sorry, 22, 15 through 22, that threw me off. He was, uh, Jesus was approached about the whole tax to Caesar. And here's the one reference that Jesus says in regards to the payment. And he, Jesus said to them, render therefore to Caesar all the things that are Caesar's, taxes. Dun, dun, dun. Taxes are due, guys, by the way, mental note. And to God, the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and they left him and they were on their way. So Jesus basically is just saying, pay, to, pay to the taxes what you need to pay to the taxes. Pay to God what you're going to pay to God. That's what we got. So it's the principle. We're talking about principles. Over time, these, these principles were put into place. And these principles created a habit, and the habit created something that we pass down from generation to generation to generation. In the church today, the tithe is not something that is regularly passed down. 
Unfortunately, at some point in our family histories, we stopped talking to our kids and really sewing into the principle of giving the first fruits. In fact, the tithe is a topic that we rarely, it's like it's almost less talked about than sex. It's like when you think about it, it's it, it, like financial stewardship. Like how many of you guys were like, why did they not teach taxes in high school? How is there not a budgeting class in high school? Hello, all these things that these people need and we're not giving them the resources they need. Well, as parents, we're passing on the honor that's needed. But is it needed? So is the principle, is this a requirement of the old covenant? Is it a law we no longer go back to? Did Jesus fulfill this and now I get to dictate how much I give and when I feel like giving? Because I call that generosity. My dictating of what we give comes from my heart of generosity. I'm glad you asked. So in true form to this series, let's go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to before the law even existed. Genesis 4. Adam and Eve have now been banished from the garden. They are now cultivating the land, and they are starting what we now know as civilization. They are being fruitful. They are multiplying. So when she, Eve, gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Let's stop and think about the fact that she gave birth and she was like, what just happened? <laughs> I mean, like, that's a moment where you're just like, did you know I could do that? I mean, come on. I, you know, with, but she gave God the honor that with the Lord's help, I created a man. She later gave birth to a son named Abel. When they, Cain and Abel, grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to God. Abel also brought a gift to God, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Well, one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's you and I go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. We look at this story, especially with the whole growing up in, um, you know, uh, children's ministries, and, and it's, we think the first sin was the fall of man fall of man. He chose to have his eyes opened. Then we go and we look at, well, the second, murder. Sin caused such jealousy and anger that it was murder. But I actually look a little bit further up in the verse. I think that there's a, a sin that's hidden in there before the actual sin that is murder. Because murder was just a fruit of this that took place a little bit further, a little bit up in the, in the scripture. You see, generations pass down honor. We pass things down. So these guys are second generation kids of mom and dad who were handmade by God. They walked in the garden with God. It's such a thing that God's actually talking to him. God's not just off somewhere. Like, there is still relationship here. So we see ourselves looking at two kids that have grown up. These are men now. How long have they been learning to cultivate the ground? How long have they been active in the birthing seasons of their flock? Was it a tradition in their family to get together and to offer God the first? You see, sin does something over time. It comes in and the enemy, now this is another thing. Let's think about the fact that you want to think that the enemy doesn't have a lot to focus on. These guys were the only two people that the enemy could practice this whole mankind thing on. They had personal attention. So it came upon the season. So how many years was it that Cain had been kind of slowly getting like, well, here we go. Let's get the crops. Let's go do the thing. Let's go do church. Let's go do the honor thing. You see, Cain didn't just wake up one day and go, ah, pff, pff. I'm just going to gather some of my crops. But the reality was is that Abel took the time and he cut 
the perfect filet. I learned that from my mom. Women go after that filet. The filet is the most fantastic part of that steak. And the fat, mm, back in the day, there was no butter, but there was fat. Or there may have been butter, but you never know. It's not in the scripture. So Abel went with a heart to prepare the finest of the firstborn of all of the flocks. He took the time to prepare it, and it notes in scripture that he gave God the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. If you have ever processed an animal or if you've ever prepared meat, you know that it's a tedious task to get the best portions. Cain presented some of his crops. The heart is really what was in question here. Why are you so angry? So the Lord sees that Cain kind of just like, you know, gathered some of his stuff and, you know, brought it and was like, here's my present to you. And Abel came and he's like, well, here's my present to you. But God saw a difference. And in that difference, God approached Cain and was like, hey, listen, what you're doing right now, if you keep at doing this and you don't do what's right, Sin is going to devour you. And Cain took that and he responded by not doing and taking God's advice. Instead, he took his own side, sin overwhelmed, and he acted out of that sin. But what was actually taking place? It was in this moment that the enemy has now successfully deceived man to rob God of God's deserved honor by giving his first and his best fruits. It was in this moment that Satan had successfully robbed honor from God. But how did the enemy do it? Well, he used the good old sin nature tactics. We're lucky to have him as a lesson holder. We normally don't like to talk about him. But really, let's just be honest, he's the creator of this fantasticness, and let's figure out how that happens. Genesis 3, 4 through 5, Then the serpent, which is Satan, said to woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you will eat it. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He offered her to be like God. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. This is about Lucifer. Oh, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest pits. What is sin nature? This was invented by the Lucifer himself. It is self-promotion over God. It is taking God, the honor for God, off the throne and placing yourself there. Placing your heart, placing your needs, placing your desire, placing it there. But we say, but, but no, I mean, there is, you know, I don't, it's, God's not, it's not an idle thing. It's not an idle. I'm going to say something kind of controversial. The only thing that the enemy is interested in is you honoring yourself and other things more than God. So, if he can, did you notice here? Satan never once said, come and worship me. No, he just gave you his tactics. I'm going to let you, don't you want to sit on the throne? Don't you deserve more? Shouldn't you be the one that gets the honor? Isn't how you feel important? You guys, we just saw with Cain and Abel the moment the enemy learned how to rob physical assets that we honor the Lord with, how to make it about us and not about God. So we look at God as the giver of all resource, the giver of all good things, and we're so caught up in whether or not the tithe 
Is old covenant or new covenant? We're so caught up on how we feel we do with generosity that we don't recognize that the true battle and the true fight is who's sitting on the throne. You ask yourself the question, well, and I heard this a couple times after speaking last week, well, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. No, the root of all evil is you feeling you deserve the honor over God. God hasn't changed his tactics. God has given recognition and knowing of who he is unto all man. Romans 1.19, For that which is known about God is evident to them and made plain in their inner consciousness because God himself has shown it to them. God built man to honor him, but he gave him the freedom of response and the ability to choose to do it. God is clear on not sitting in his seat. Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me. He hasn't changed his expectation to be given the praise of your first fruits. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. He wants your sacrifice of worship Hebrews 13, 15, therefore, let us offer through Jesus continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And he makes it pretty simple. Let's go back to Cain and Abel and let's think about them for a moment. James 4, 7, therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, that temptation, and he will flee from you. It's pretty simple. If Tally's here, he can go ahead and come on up. You see, we're called to a life of stewardship. We're called to a life of knowing what our priorities are. From those priorities, they drive our heart. It takes discipline and self-discipline. But ultimately, the real, the real core of this is who is sitting on the throne when it comes to the honor that you give with your finances. When we look back to the first lesson and we say that resources were given by God for man to enjoy and he wants an intimate relationship with you, it was at a certain point that we see sin took over the moment that we felt that our gift wasn't good enough. The Lord's going after the Cain's. The Lord's going after the heart of wasn't it good enough? The Lord's going after what our heart really wants to do when it comes to honoring Him. And this is not something that we just go, Lord, can you just, you know, just make this happen? He's like, hey, guess what? Finances mean discipline. It takes a change of heart, but here's what it takes. You cannot have kingdom blessings without kingdom disciplines. And kingdom disciplines mean you have to have self-discipline. You have to know what your goal is. And you make your choices. You make your decisions. Not for how you feel right now, but you make them so that you hit that goal. If that goal is to give God all the honor, all the praise, give him every resource you have, then you got to go back to the heart of what your worship actually is. When money comes up and finances come up, before you get to budgeting, before you get to stewardship, before you get to the breakdown, which by the way, we live in a day and age where these resources are at your fingertips and it's your lack of discipline and your lack of motivation to picking it up and following through. So with all of that aside, and it comes back to the core issue, where is God in your priorities? God's not after your pocketbook. God's not after making sure that he gets every part of, you know, well, I got to see her book down. No, God's after, do you honor me with everything 
recognizing that I am the giver of all your first fruits. Because when you have submission in that area, sin can't come in and control you with the jealousy, with the issues, making it about you. Our heart change, we may look at our lives and some of us are really good with, we're really good with finances. But I have something really exciting in store and that is what the Lord's doing with revival, what the Lord's doing with kingdom blessings. You guys, when we say the word hilarious generosity, it's only hilarious if he's on the throne. It's only generosity if he's on the throne. But to get there, we need to figure out the areas that we need to get off the throne. Would you guys stand as we close? I'm just gonna pray for you. And the work that's to be done, this is work that you do between husband and wife. This is work you do on your drive home. This is work you do in conversations. But the biggest question that you can ask is, God, where am I on the throne and where do you want me off the throne? Where do I need to place you back on the throne? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the commitment that you have to us. We thank you that when you created us, you created our well-being, you created our lives. Lord, you created them with resources as being a, non, a non-topic for us because you, we recognize you are the giver of all things. Holy Spirit, would you go deep into the hearts and the areas that we can sense and feel the revival. We can sense and feel your name going out to the nations. But Lord, let us get out of the way. Would you begin to reveal? Would you begin to show? Would you begin to take so that we're able to see you as the king of our resources. Lord, I speak a blessing onto every single household here because there are heavenly resources available. Begin to work in us and prepare us to be able to carry the load that you're about to pour out. Father, we are in agreement that you are the king above all kings. If you agree with me, would you say amen? Let's worship real quick before we head out. Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out. Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? Here is every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Just tell so much you